So you know, I'll just start off like I gave you guys a list before. So just trying to figure out what do vaccines do? So what, what vaccines do first and foremost is reducing the risk for the person who's vaccinated to um, get severe disease or to potentially die from COVID-19. That's where the vaccines are best at and always had been and with Omicron even more so. So what I mean by that is that the, uh, the vaccines, they get a hit from Omicron in terms of their effectiveness, how well they work. but the piece around protect, protecting you from severe disease seems to be largely maintained, may get improved further with a third dose in particular if you're elderly and have comorbidities and so on. So that's, I, I think, the good news piece around Omicron as well. Where the vaccines get a significant hit is for that so-called neutralizing immunity. So your ability to prevent from getting infected to start with and as such to prevent infecting someone else, right? That's where we see a significant reduction from both natural immunity for those who have had the infection and from vaccine immunity, given that um, immune escape that Omicron has. And here again, the third dose seems to be helping to restore that hit that um, the vaccines take with, with Omicron. To what extent that will play out in real world is to be seen but again it looks like there's a there's a benefit with the third dose in restoring uh that neutralizing immunity to a relatively large extent so uh with that third dose uh which we're just starting to open up now to 18 and up on monday does it help prevent infection it <sighs> To the best of our understanding, it does improve your protection from infection again. So with two doses, that risk has increased again because Omicron can escape some of that immunity. And with the third dose, we can improve that again. How high we get and whether it will be as effective as the two doses for Delta still needs to be seen. But based on the data we have to date, it looks like it restores most of that hit by getting a third dose. And what about transmission? Because the you know, leading up to this, people initially when we were getting one and two dose, you know, people were being told, hey, you're getting your vaccine not just for yourself, but for someone else. Because if you, you you know, you won't be able to project it to transmit it to someone else. Do vaccines help prevent transmission, spreading it to someone else? So first and foremost, if it can prevent for you from getting infected, it reduces the risk for everyone around you as well, right? So that's the first way how a vaccine can prevent transmission is by making sure that, that we don't even get the infection. And as I said, uh, we had a very decent protection from that for Delta with the two vaccines. We now hope that with the third dose, you will see at least a similar effect for Omicron as well in terms of preventing you from getting infected and as such preventing you from transmitting it further. The, um, the data around if you are infected, to what extent you continue to infect others, so if you have a breakthrough infection, there's been very mixed data with Delta already, to what extent it actually reduces your risk um, once you have that breakthrough infection. My, my interpretation still is, yes, that there was probably a benefit with Delta, whether that's still true with Omicron and to what extent um, needs to be seen. But again, taking that step back, the main reason why you get vaccinated, nothing changed with that is to protect yourself from severe disease, and this seems to be very well maintained with Omicron. Right. And for those who, who have not escaped yeah. severe disease, whether they're you know double dose or triple dose, it just so happens that it, it, it hits them, it happens. So who, who are the people in ICU? Like what, what are their, what's their physical makeup? Like, because now I'm hearing more and more from chief medical officers of health, you know, we need to protect people who are, you know, uh, living with comorbidities and, you know, obesity. Are, are these the people who are a majority making up hospitalizations in ICUs? 
Um, yes, I, I think that that's a very good summary. So uh, the main risk factors that we have for hospital admission and ICU admission, first for, and foremost, is lack of immunity. So uh, no vaccines and no formal infection. That puts you into a much higher risk category. And among those, it's in particular those who are elderly, who are frail, who have multiple comorbidities, and obesity is one of those. Uh, that put you at higher risk for requiring that level of care in, in an ICU. We don't necessarily, or we wouldn't expect at this point of time that this will be any different with Omicron. So we expect that the same pattern that we see since Alpha, I would say, is probably uh, going to continue. Before Alpha with mild type, the majority of the patients that we saw in hospital were very elderly and then with the alpha wave, so the second wave, we saw more and more, um, uh, I should probably not say younger patients, but it, it was going back down into the 60s, 50s and 40s more. So somewhere in that 40 to 50 range is where uh, there's sort of a switch to increase the risk more significantly. And that was also the rationale as to why the entire vaccine um, initiative was going down by age groups because we clearly saw age is the main risk factor that people have and there's nothing you can do about that you're either 80 or you're 40 and uh, also the rationale for uh, going out with the third doses for 50 up first the rationale for that was that this is the age group where we see more and more need for hospital admission and ICU admission plus the data that we've seen that uh, boosters of third doses in those patients uh, have the most likely benefit in reducing, again, severity and death. Right. And so if I'm a 50-year-old healthy person, would, would I have a better chance of, of and, and I'm also triple dosed, do I have a better chance of averting severe disease than a 50-year-old who has, you know, diabetes may have, or, you know, or you know, had a transplant or a cancer survivor, also triple vax, do, does, the, does the, the, the first person have a better chance of not ending up in hospital? Yeah, yeah. If, if you, once you're comparing sort of same age group, everything else the same, but one person has comorbidities, the other doesn't, then the risk for that person with comorbidities becomes much higher. Now, obviously, we have sort of a correlation between age and comorbidities. Typically, those number of comorbidities increase over, over with increasing age, right? Um, and that's why age really probably stands out in terms of a risk factor. But yeah, if you take two patients, same age group, one entirely healthy, the other one with mul multiple comorbidities, obesity, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, the second person's risk would be would be significantly higher than the first person's risk. Right, and so when we see the deaths, when we see deaths, are they dying as COVID killed them, or are they dying because they died because of a core morbidity and they just so happen to test positive for COVID? Are we seeing what are we? Seeing? I think yeah, I, I I see your question. I mean, there's coincidental death that did occur. So someone happens to test positive, didn't have or hardly had any symptoms and would have died of their metastatic cancer and was to be expected anyways, or happened to have a trauma, um, car accident, whatever, and happened to test positive. So there's some of those scenarios certainly out there. But if you have a patient who needs hospital admission because of COVID, you can more or less safely assume that the death was eventually due to COVID rather than coincidental. But there are the other cases, that's for sure, or palliative cases who develop COVID, remain asymptomatic thanks to the vaccine and die eventually of their, say, cancer disease. That's not really a COVID death, right? But the majority of those who require hospital admission because of COVID and if they um, they die eventually, then most likely COVID was the main reason or at least the major contributing reason in someone who has other multiple comorbidities and as such less of a reserve to deal with that in addition to the other health issues someone may already have. All right, so now to the, now other, to the other 
spectrum. But I, I have a kid, he's just over a year old. He's not eligible for any vaccine. So, you know, yeah. we're, we're vaccinating kids now, five to 11. And, you know, there, there's thoughts of, you know, shutting down schools longer after Christmas break. So what, what's the situation on, on COVID affecting kids? Like, are we seeing children in hospital admitted for just COVID, like not for anything else, but kids getting so bad that they're, they're ending up in hospital? Are we seeing that in, in Hamilton hospitals? Yeah, we did see that. And we, we pulled the numbers in terms of hospital discharges. That's the kind of data we have readily available. And we have had 91 discharges of children who had a diagnosis of COVID or positive COVID test since the very beginning of the pandemic uh, up to end of October. That's the data that we were able to pull. And just to give you some context here, September this year, it was six cases. In October, it was seven cases. Now, that doesn't give you the information whether these are coincidental positives or admissions because of COVID. And it's a mixed bag, that's for sure. We, we see both, in particular in kids. Um, we probably picked up more coincidental cases than in adults because they tend to be less symptomatic or the symptoms may be less clear. Uh, so we are very much in the side of caution in testing them. And, um, they may have come in for another reason. But just to give you an idea of what the load is, when you compare it with the number of people, the number of adults we would be admitting, those would be much, much higher numbers. So it's a rare occurrence, but it does occur occasionally. And are, are the kids, when they do get admitted to hospital, like for, hospital. not incidental, but for COVID, like are they getting treatments? Are they, are they staying overnight? Or is it like a, a test and they, what, what's that experience? Yes. Well, the, what I mentioned, those were the ones that had been admitted. So that stayed at least 24 hours overnight and didn't work. It wasn't the scenario. You just come in, get tested, get reassured that, well, it may be COVID, it may be another respiratory virus. Uh, the child is good enough to go home. This would be scenarios where people had to stay again, either because of the infection was so severe or because of other reasons that brought the person in. Um, often it's, again, comorbidities that those kids would have, right? I, I, I have some national data from, from a large like network of mostly academic hospitals across Canada and looking at um, pediatric ICU uh, cases and how this compares where um, the vast, vast majority would obviously be uh, admitted because of COVID. So it wouldn't be coincidental that you end up in the pediatric ICU unless, again, you happen to have a trauma and needed that level of care because of that. And uh, looking at the last few months there, um, in summer, it was relatively consistent, 0% of admitted patients in a PICU being COVID positive, and it increased up to 5% by mid-October. So again, it's, it was at max 1 in 20 kids in a pediatric ICU being COVID-related. But again, it, it tells you that once you have a significant uh, volume out there, yes, it hits one or the other hit very rarely, but it can occur that they require typically then oxygen therapy to some extent. That's why they would go to the pediatric ICU. The vast, vast majority of them will recover well. Right. And um, to talk about masks, because now obviously we know it's airborne. So I don't see a lot of people wear N95s. Uh, it's mainly either uh, people have gotten, you know, these cloth fashion-y masks that see a lot of retailers sell now you see like neoprene you see like the regular like these surgical masks as well what what did those do to prevent to, to keep someone safe i guess we have best estimates of what they do um it's hard to pinpoint a specific percentage of risk reduction i will put it that way there was a systematic review published recently a systematic review sort of a review of all the literature out there that tried to estimate how much protection you get from a uh, from a face mask um, and they estimated 
probably roughly 50% risk reduction. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. It would probably be anywhere from down to 20, 30% up to maybe 60, 70%. But they came up with 45 to 50% risk reduction. Um, so, um, and then the other piece is um, well fitted medical masks are probably better than just the cloth masks. And in theory, respirators may be better. The issue there is it's hard to conclude from theory to how they would function in the real world, right? Um, but all of this being said, yes, any type of face covering seems to have some level of effect, but nothing is full proven, right? So uh, nothing is perfect. And uh, at the population level, even if it's only a 20, 30% risk reduction, it reduces your uh, how quickly the, or how easily the the, um, uh, the virus can spread, uh, and it makes a difference for the population at large. For the specific individual, whether my risk after a specific contact, say, is five percent or twenty percent lower than that, doesn't make an awful lot of a difference for me. But for thousands and thousands of people with that kind of interactions, even a relatively small difference can make. Um, a difference for the population at large. And I think that's one, just one piece to keep in mind when you feel like, oh, 40, 50% risk reduction, that seems quite low. Uh, yes, for an individual, it's not great, but at the population level, it still makes a difference. And again, that's talking about indoor prolonged exposure kind of scenarios, um, outdoor, et cetera, um, it makes much less of a difference. Yeah, is that, is, does that still stay like that? Does that still hold that outdoors is still the best place to be? I, I think that's, that still stays and we, have, we don't see anything that would suggest differently with Omicron now uh, in terms of that. So that roughly 20% lower, uh, 20 times lower, not 20% lower, 20, 20 times lower risk uh, outdoors versus indoors still seems to hold true. Again, it's an estimate, but it's it's a huge difference when you think about it compared to what we may be achieving with with face coverings indoors. And so, trying to move forward because it seems like you know, yes, vaccinating is good to prevent people from clogging the healthcare system for sure. Like with severe illness and ICU beds, we only have. I, know, I think the premier said we only have about eleven hundred backup right now. So moving forward in terms of like therapies, I see that St. Joe's is the only place in Ontario right now with a, uh, a pilot program with monoclonal antibodies. What, and we see, you know, Merck is making a pill, Pfizer's making a pill. What, what is their role going to be to help us move forward and hopefully reduce capacity or the need for filling ICUs with, with severe COVID patients? I would say the pilot that we have within the city run by Sancho's um, had been a very, very positive experience. Um, based on the small numbers that, that we had, we, we, we estimate that, that we were certainly able to, uh, to avoid uh, a few hospitalizations and probably ICU admissions with the monoclonal antibodies, keeping in mind that this is a treatment first and foremost for those who haven't been vaccinated and don't have immunity. So you sort of give them the immunity at the point of time that they have the infection rather than vaccinating them up front. So they already have the immunity once they get exposed. And then there's, there's cases with who have a severely immunocompromised status being after transplant or high dose chemotherapy uh, or other treatments that we know that reduce your immune uh, reaction or immune response very significantly, that's where we would have used or continue to use those antibody treatments at this point. Uh, the issue with Omicron though is that the one product that we have used first and foremost, where we had the best supply, we will be losing, it looks like, because it no longer works, or if it works, it's only very minimally. Uh, there's another product out there that should continue to work based on, on the best evidence that we have at this point, but very limited supply. So we need to see how well that supply looks like. 
but it may remain a, a option for us for, um, for the non-immune uh, population. Right, and, and which is kind of good because it seems like, you know, the people that are getting severely sick in the ICU are, at least for now, the majority are unvaccinated people. They may have comorbidities as well. So that treatment, once it's widespread, I know you don't, you're not at St. Joe's, once it's widespread, that could, could that help? No. Oh, sorry, we're back. Yeah, I, I lost you. You, oh. you were getting oh, I was uh, talking slow one, slow one, then I lost you. Yeah, I was good, we're back. Uh, so, yeah, so when you, yeah, because I, I read the qualifications to get the monoclonal antibody treatment is, yeah, you, unvaccinated, you have to have been tested and it's within the first 10 days of being in positive. Uh, you have to have, you know, severe, you know, you have to have the comorbidities, but those are the people that are going to hospital and going to ICU. So could this be a, could this change once we get more supply, you know, the, the fight, the, the, the landscape of the fight against COVID? Um, I, I think in terms of uh, the monoclonal antibodies, there's, there's probably little to no benefit for those who already have immunity. So that's the, the limiting factor there. I think that's where the antivirals would kick in. And there's two products that are sort of coming, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. The MEC product, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be as successful anymore now that we see the full data. Um, but the, the Pfizer product still looks very, very promising with 80, 90% risk reduction hospital admission as long as given within three or even five days after onset of symptoms. And that's a time period where um, you could easily get people tested who have higher risk um, based on age, comorbidities, and so on to get tested, get that positive test and start the treatment. So five days seems very, very doable. While if you have to start something within a day or two, often that, that time window would be too short. So I, I'm at this point very optimistic with, with the antiviral, in particular the one from Pfizer, that it may be, well, the game changer we are waiting for and be able, in addition to the immunity that we have been building with vaccines first and foremost, that we have another readily available tool at our hands, at our disposal, that we can use easily in community-based patients, right? They don't have to come in like with the antibody treatment and get an infusion. Uh, you can write them a script and they can start the treatment at home and with checking in with them to making sure that they don't develop any of those severe symptoms, they can be easily managed at home and, and recover. So very optimistic about that drug for sure in terms of options moving forward. But yeah, we are not there yet. We don't have it available yet, but I hope it's not going to take too much time until we get access and uh, that it will not be too short in supply, but obviously the global uh, need for this drug will be huge. So we will see how this will play out. All right, I appreciate that. Is there is something I missed or something that you want to talk about while we got you here about, about this continued uh, battle? Um, I, I think there was one question that you had about cases are high, only 10% of Omicron yeah. higher yeah. cases are. But I think you're aware that we are at least estimating at this point that right, it, right. it's higher it's now. Already, it's yeah. already dominant with probably more than 50% Omicron. And for the first time now, I see that the estimated RT for Delta is actually below one. So it really looks at this point that Omicron not only adds up, it also replaces Delta. And uh, I think the expectation at this point is that if the same happens as is Alpha and Delta back then, that in a couple of weeks or so, uh, Delta will be um, only a residual in terms of what we see, and it will be first and foremost Omicron. As I said, currently it's roughly 50-50. So all I said in terms of what changes in terms of the game now, uh, that's going to be Omicron. And from, from here forward, uh, pretty much every case is considered Omicron unless proven otherwise. Um, I, I think that that's important to understand. And I think the other piece maybe to add to the discussion we had around um, vaccines is um, 
you can hide as long from from the virus, right? At some point, it will get to you. And with Omicron, it makes it even much more likely that, that it will get you within the next few weeks or months. And the choice that we really have with the vaccines is, do we want to build immunity before we get that first exposure to the virus, or do we want to wait for that first exposure? And I think the evidence clearly shows, go ahead, get your vaccine, you're much more protected once you get that first exposure. And then the data from particular South Africa also suggests that uh, that hybrid immunity, so you, you're vaccinated but happen to get the, the infection at some point, increases your immune response significantly also against Omicron. So it will protect you even better moving forward. So vaccines remain to me the um, the main means we have to to plant the impact for Omicron. So when I, I started hearing that lately from Peter uh, Uni, and I'm, I'm hearing it more about now that we're getting more information from South Africa, Peter Uni even called them like superhumans that they have had infections and then it got double dosed. Um, they're younger, uh, all these different parameters that kind of changed their outlook a little bit. When I, I've never heard that before. So I, I wonder like if you're, I, I got, uh, some of our viewers are youngish. So if you're less than 40, you're double vaxxed and you hear these, you know, in South Africa, they previous infections have, have boosted their immunity. Would they, should these, like, I could see them thinking, do I even need a booster or should I just like go to a club and try to get COVID and then I'll be okay. Cause I'm, you know, young and I'm healthy. I, you're not going to, to recommend that option, right? But uh, yeah, it I certainly, I, I will put it that way. If it happens that you get the infection, there's at least a benefit from you down the road that uh, you have that extra protection, which is which might be based on the South African data above and beyond of what you can achieve with vaccines only. But again, what we want to avoid is that it's your very first encounter with for your immune system being an infection. Once you're fully vaccinated and you get that exposure, then yeah, the benefit of that is that you can boost your you would boost your immunity with with the infection and maybe even better off than someone who gets the booster but um that wouldn't result in a in a um recommendation that yeah. you should seek a a covid party right yeah. but no, yeah. at least there's there's um a benefit or silver lining to those infections that are going to happen with those breakthrough infections that it should protect you very well and much much better than for the next encounter you will have with the virus Yes. No, I will not. I will not say that you recommend any. I, I, I don't see anyone, Doug Ford or Kieran Moore, coming out there saying, you know, host a party and do this on purpose. But yeah, no. All right. Well, Dr. Martz, I appreciate this. Uh, it's definitely cleared my head a little bit because I was, when things started happening last week, I'm like, whoa, what is going on right now? Things are changing. Double Vex is now not as effective in infection. And, uh, but yeah, so I guess the, the expansion of boosters on Monday uh, will definitely help. And we'll see. And it seems like people are also picking up rapid tests like crazy. Uh, and if you want to weigh in on rapid tests, I know their role on you know people's everyday lives if you want to. Um, but it seems like people are definitely accepting those with enthusiasm. I, I, I mean, with this rapid test, there's been a, a huge public interest in those and, and now they are readily available for those who want them. Um, I was always a proponent of using them in a targeted way much more than we would have had. Now the shift goes entirely to, well, use them at your will. I, me personally, I see the main, the main benefit of rapid tests to sort of that return to work, return to school type of testing where someone would have had an exposure but you, you don't want to interfere too much with, it's, I would say, the essential pieces of your life and then implement rapid testing in those settings to make sure, well, you test in the morning as long as you're negative, you go back to school. The UK has done a very nice study on that, which shows that the risk to the class cohort remains the same, but it's much less interruptive for, uh, for the schools, right? I, I think that this, there's probably in addition to just handing it out, which is happening now, 
hopefully a way to use them very targeted in those specific settings as well, or thinking about uh, healthcare, for example, where we may need to pull in people who have had an exposure um, because we have to run a hospital regardless of what's happening out there. And there, again, using rapid tests may make it possible to test people on a daily basis during that time period that they, have a, they are at risk of developing the disease um, and to bring them safely back into, into work or school. So that's, that's where a very targeted use of, of rapid antigen tests may be very beneficial for us moving into the months to come. Yeah. All right, knowledge is key. 